Mission. Norms, laws, all kinds of things. This thing has to become subject to those things. All right. In the oral stage, that's that first year of the baby. The baby is so oriented around the mouth, so sucking and eating and so forth. Then it moves into the anal stage, which second year, which is delightful because then everything has to do with the ass. <laughs> and if they poop, they don't see a thing in the world wrong with getting their hand down there and just... <laughs> and you're standing there going absolutely nuts, okay? And you're saying, you know, we got to get this kid socialized, okay? So we start all these ways of teaching that child, don't, 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 no, no, no. Every once in a while you say, oh, dear God, yes. <laughs> now, that's the problem initially that id and civilization have. Okay, so you have a, now remember these are not entities in Freud, they're functions. Okay, so don't think about a little id sitting down there. That's that cauldron of stuff coming out of the cellular structure. It's a somatic excitation. My body gets excited and it wants something here. So the ego is based on the reality principle. That is, it knows what it is going through on the one hand, and it knows as it develops what society wants on the other. So its job is to convince this, I know what you want, and I know what they're telling you to do. If you'll trust me, I can help you get what you want and still stay okay with the larger world. You get what's going on? So ego gets power from the id by satisfying it in socially acceptable ways. Got the picture? All right, now let's do it this way. I'm standing before you. Let's say it's not true. I'm standing before you. I have an itch. It's a body excitation. The only answer to it is to scratch. However, I cannot scratch there in front of you. So I am under considerable excitation. And ego says... Give me a minute and let me think. Okay. But don't, superego says, don't you dare reach there and scratch yourself. If you do, I'll paralyze your arm. <laughs> it may be an empty threat, but sometimes it works. Okay. All right. So ego says, all right, I got it. Id, sit down. Cross your leg. Now swing your foot real fast. <laughs> now notice a couple of things about it. Uh, that may relieve the itch, but it's never quite as good as scratching it. All right? So that you get, when you adhere to this and try to respond to this, you do deal with it, but it ain't ever quite as good. So you live with some stuff that you have to repress. So you say something like, look, in public, I'm never going to get to scratch the way I want to scratch. I'm just going to have to live with it. Okay. Now, sometimes that is of such a character that it has to do with your basic life and you're never going to get it adequately scratched. So you live with it. And what you get, he would say, is a kind of a uh, obsessional neurosis. Now, remember, 
Remember this about neuros. The World Health Organization will no longer use the word. So it's become in disrepute in a number of psychological circles. I would say that there are all kinds of very reputable people who don't talk about neurosis anymore. If you go to a doctor, uh, I'm talking about a psychiatrist and he, who is a doctor, and he says you've got a neurosis, you are probably in the hands of a Freudian. That ain't necessarily bad. There are revised forms of Freud. Uh, there's a guy named Lacan who basically takes Freud's uh, id, ego, and superego and rereads them in linguistic categories. I just love him. I'm not sure he's right, but I love him. Okay. So, and you get uh, some of the more recent people, uh, the, uh, oh, the wonderful object relations Freudian who reads him differently. She's a, uh, what is her name? Uh, ah, well, I, I'll remember it maybe later. Uh, who, who have basically reinterpreted uh, him. And you can imagine, well, you'll see that later. You can imagine that a lot of women want to reinterpret Freud. We'll talk about that momentarily. Okay. But you hear this obsessional neurosis. And neurosis means there's a basic conflict between ego and id that never gets resolved. Okay. Suppose, let's say you were somehow abused sexually as a child, and you've got serious energy, sexual energy around it, but you've got an ego that was introduced to this in fairly brutal terms. How do you get over that contradiction? It can become very obsessional. We're obsessed with it. Can't ignore it. Can't get over it. Can't get past it. It just hangs in there. And so the contradiction is ongoing. Right. Let me give you another one that I don't like to even talk about. <clears throat> it says something like this. There are people who have high <coughs> ethical standards. Does that mean they did PhDs in ethics? And what you've got there is somebody who's repressed <laughs> a lot of other stuff. Hmm? And so they uh, talk this and attempt to live this because they got a bunch of other stuff going on. They don't want to. Admit. Um, right? You ever notice highly ethical people who just seem tight-assed? Hmm? Freud would say, hmm. Okay. So, there's a lot of interesting stuff in Freud. Maybe it's not quite the way he says it is. But someone said it this way about Freud. Freud was a wonderful observer. It's his interpretations you've got to watch. <laughs> so, so we always interpret, yeah. What do you suppose his IQ? Oh, he was off the charts. His, how high do they get? He was, uh, he was reading Shakespeare at, was it eight? if not before, he finished first in almost everything. You know, he, he mastered two or three different professional areas. Uh, he's brilliant. But if you know very many brilliant people, you know how wrong they can be. <laughs> so that, that doesn't necessarily mean they're right. It just means they're brilliant, you know. Uh, so, but anyhow, uh, any questions about this before we go a little further? 
because I want to spend most of our time on how he saw religion, okay? That's what we agreed to do. Your notes do more than that. The notes deal with some things like defenses that ego develops. Repression is one defense of ego. Another one would be what's called a, uh, reaction formation. I love that one. You know, when somebody's come to your house and they came at six and they had supper with you and it's midnight and you've been wishing since 10 o'clock that they would go home. And finally at midnight, they say, well, it's getting late. I guess we'd better go. And you say, oh, the night is young. Please don't go yet. But meanwhile, you're saying to yourself, oh, dear God, I hope you will go. That's a reaction formation. You're forming a reaction you don't really have in order to be what? Nice. Hospitable. Okay. He's got he's got a number of those. Repression is one, reaction formation is another, and I've got a list of them in your notes. Okay? Any uh any comments or questions about that? That's probably stuff you've heard one way or another in the past, is it? Uh, uh the, uh, I love Freud, uh, but I don't have to agree with people I love. <laughs> uh, okay. Now, uh, comment, question, anything? All right, let's go to one more step because this Oedipal complex is crucial in Freud's understanding of religion. <clears throat> the Oedipal complex, he gets it from the old Greek tragedy, you know, where the man kills his father, not knowing he was his father uh, because he was blind. And uh, the, uh, and Freud just takes that and says, you know, you've got these stages in Freud, you've got oral, we talked about anal. We talked about uh, uh, phallic, uh, latent, uh, adolescent, and then uh, genital. You can see how important sex is for Freud. Okay. Is very basic important. This is about up to a year. This is the second year. This is, uh, I'm sorry, this is the first year. This is the second year. That's a three to five. This is kind of between five and adolescence. And adolescence <coughs> until you achieve uh, a genital, by which he means a mature state. That's when you've got your... In its best sense for Freud, it means that your 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 bodily energies have found appropriate satisfactions within the larger society, and you've achieved a maturity of reason that enables you to function there uh, successfully without too many of the debilitating defenses that keep you uh, sick. <laughs> uh, am I saying that? In other words, he thinks you can be a relatively healthy person who's negotiated your embodied energies with the demands of the society. And you found sublimations, you know. Uh, you may have... Uh, you may have sexual needs out the door, but you have some ways of satisfying those on the one hand, and then you have work that you engage in that really absorbs a lot of that energy. Okay? That make some kind of sense. And just a hint ahead of time, one of the things he believes is that if we can become more reasonable, we won't need religion. It's an obsessional neurosis uh, that satisfies all kinds of wishes. And we can get past that if we will. Now remember, 
a couple of things about the guy. He's born in uh, 1856. So he's an adult by, uh, he's 20 years old in 76. He's in a Victorian society right, where there is tremendous uh, kind of squelching of sexuality and an awful lot of energies. He's a fairly well-to-do, privileged guy. We now know that working classes, for example, were not like people like Freud. <laughs> the working classes did not tend to sit on their feelings the way uh, the upper established elite privileged people did. Uh, but nevertheless, he's working, he's, he's growing up. He's a young man in that situation. One of the questions about Freud is, he names some dynamics here. What if they were true? Would they be true in all times and places? Okay. Remember this in terms of, I want to call it uh, post postmodern thought. Postmodern thought tends to say something like this. There are no foundations for our knowing. Not even in science. Science is based in paradigms. And the plain fact is those paradigms change. They've changed in our own lifetime. The paradigm from Einstein to what we're doing now is different. Okay? Now let's do another one. Historicity of thought. How you think now is nothing like the way people thought 100. Well, that's too strong. But how we think now is not the way people thought 100 years ago. All right. Language. Language varies. I have people get mad at me because I tell them that you can't tell. Uh, you don't know what a word means necessarily. Let me give you an example. There's a wonderful philosopher by the name of Derrida. He talks about the concept of difference. Did I spell that right? Is that an A or an E? E. e. Uh, I can actually spell on a piece of paper. I can't spell on a chalkboard. Or something. And my students give me, just give me hell about it because I was a stickler on spelling with their papers. And I could, you know, the word separate. I always had students who spelled it this way. I would say to them, there is a rat and separate. Okay. So they used to give me hell about my chalkboard spelling and that I should expect the same standards of my chalkboard spelling, you know, but difference means two things. It does mean difference, not not alike, but it also means to defer, which means language is established on difference. If I say hot, you want the opposite of that. What would it be? Cold. All right. So language is based on difference. But when you use a word, the meaning, Derrida would say, is always deferred. What does hot mean? Heated. Huh? Heated. Hot. Hot? What does it mean? Heated. Heated. Really? So if so if a 20 year old sees this very beautiful young woman walking out the street and says she's hot, is she heated? <laughs> Oh, so, well, you just deferred the meaning of hot. Well, how are you using it? What if I've got, I don't. What if I had a stolen wrench in my toolbox? I don't. Uh, somebody might say, you've got a hot wrench. Hmm. Huh. What do you mean? Well, hot, now we could do more, but hot means three things, at least. Ah, but you continue. When does that actually end? 
Derrida would say, it does. We have conventional ways in which we decide it ends, but the deferral continues, continues, continues. So when we're dealing in language, are we dealing with certainty? Now, then, I'll stop with this for nuts enough, but then you also got this whole business of interpretation. One, one philosopher says to interpret is to violate. Anytime you interpret somebody's thought, you have violated them. Hmm. Pardon me? Oh, uh, yes. What's really interesting is how much trouble the scientists are in. <laughs> you see, <laughs> what this basically argues is a plague on all your houses. Okay? What do you think science will look like in a thousand years? Huh? Well, uh, we don't know, of course. My hunch would be it'll be different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe not stupid. We've had an awful lot of bright people in science, and science has had amazing success. I mean, look at it. Uh, we even put men on the moon. We may not be able to do it now, but we did it <laughs> once more time. So the, po the point is, when it comes to truth, let, let me, let me uh, 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 I love, you know, I love Foucault. That doesn't mean I think he's right altogether, but he says the truth now, I was raised with this. I was raised that truth is correspondence of a statement with reality. Hmm? Is that right? You know what Foucault says? No, truth is the correspondence of a discourse. C O U R with a form of life. What happens when the form of life changes? Or what happens when the discourse changes. Does it affect the form of life? Is it even more complicated than that? Are we, are we talking? No, I'm going to stay stupid. Huh? I'm going to stay stupid. <laughs> you're, you're, you're going to stay stupid. Well, you know, and I would too, if I were, if I were building a house, I'd want to say, I want that corner provided that's in the blueprint, I want that corner to be 90 degrees. And given the instruments I've got, we're going to measure it, and we're going to make sure it's 90 degrees. But I think you'd be hard-pressed to argue that Foucault hasn't named that. Well, I built houses that weren't 90 degree angles because that's the way they are. Well, but that, that's why I made the exception. Yeah. You've got some others that aren't 90 degrees. But then you make them according to that discourse, that plan, whatever. No? Yeah. What if somebody says all houses ought to be 90 degrees? No. No? Uh-huh. <laughs> See, you're agreeing with uh, Foucault. Maybe. <laughs> all right. So <clears throat> enough of that. Now, let's go over here to Freud. That's very important when you're dealing with Freud because Freud... Freud makes some extraordinary claims. Let's listen to this, uh, if I can find it. Uh, he says this, nothing can withstand reason and experience. 
And the contradiction which religion offers to both is all too palpable, clear. Even purified religious ideas cannot escape this fate so long as they try to preserve anything of the consolation of religion. Now, what he just did there was to say, you can really trust reason and experience, but not faith. <laughs> I want to say to him, Freud, you just don't get it how much faith is involved in reason and experience. And there is a, I'm not talking about religious faith. I'm talking about a level of trust and a confidence in the uh, fiduciary character of any statement. In other words, you make a truth claim. And what I've been trying to say is that there's a level of trust that is operative in that claim. I get that from a guy named Carl, uh, not Carl, that's his brother, Michael Polanyi, who says that knowing in any endeavor, he was a fairly good scientist, by the way, he says knowing in any endeavor has a fiduciary component. For one thing, you got to trust that the language says what you think it's saying, but it's more than that. Okay, Let's, enough of that. Jeez. All right, now let's look at religion a little more directly. How does that always wind up on the opposite end of where I am? And we had two of these, and one of them's disappeared. Okay, now what's really important for Freud, inevitably, is this Oedipal complex. It's central to his entire system, but... It's very important for his understanding of religion. Oedipal complex is this. When you're born, you're in that oral stage. Uh, you have no thoughts. You have energies. Uh, you have id. And you've got this figure, breast or bottle, that provides you with solutions to your excitations, okay? And you develop a relationship with her. What happens after a while is you realize and name her mama. And later she also changes your diaper and if you feel discomfort when that happens and she changes it, you associate her not only with milk and food and warmth and hugging and but also cleaning you up, making your butt feel better or your diaper feel dry, you know. And what happens is you fall in love with her. She is, and it's a selfish love. She provides everything you want. Oh, dear God, I love that person, mama. Then as you move along, you realize you got a competitor. Your daddy hmm, is her husband. And she treats him differently than you. But you kind of want her attention entirely. And you sure don't want that jerk getting in the way. But then you begin to realize Gad Zeus, he's powerful. I mean, I remember we're talking traditional family in Freud. He walks in the door, everything changes in the house. And my mama changes. And I've got a feeling that when he kisses my mama, he kisses her differently than he kisses me. And he touches my mama in places where he doesn't touch me. I hate the son of a bitch. <laughs> And I want him out of the way. So I want to kill him. Ooh. No, wait a minute now. Can't kill him? You can't kill him. Well, I want to kill him. You got to repress that notion. Right. So you want to kill him. And uh, you also become afraid because he's really powerful. You know, if he wanted to, he could castrate you. <laughs> So now, 
you got this. And if I cross him the wrong way, he'll cut my what's it off. Hmm? So I'm going to repress that. Hmm? I'm going to get rid of it. Now, that's really interesting. What if you're a girl? Hmm. Girl has that intimate relationship with mother. Wants to identify with mother. Does identify with mother. But that father comes in too. Huh? And the problem with that father, he's got something I don't have. He got a penis. And I don't have one. And so my mama pays attention to him too. But I want a penis like he's got, but I can't get it. So I've got to stuff that. Now, what she will tend to do, now there's a wonderful psychiatrist uh, who criticizes Freud named Chattero. And she says that while the woman not only sees the mother as primary care, lover, answer to all my problems, you know, that, that, that on one hand, she and I are the same. Whereas my father is different. And I can't identify with him, finally. I identify with my mother. So that my identity is not found leaving my mother and going into the external world. My identity is found by identifying with my mother. And she argues that's why women and girls in these kinds of societies have less problems with identity and don't spend significant, typically, don't spend significant amounts of time trying to establish identity in the external world and apart from mama. Hmm? Now, she may not be right. One of the questions she asks is, she asks, I think, appropriately, is the Oedipal complex true of all societies? Or is it characteristic of some and not of others? That'd be one question. The other question is, is it characteristic of any society? <laughs> okay. Here. All right. Now, <clears throat> so you get this kind of desire and identification with the mother. You ever notice, you ever notice 14 year old boys? I'm going to be myself. And they start raising hell. Why? I'm going to be in conflict with my dad, and I don't finally get my mom. So I'm going to raise hell. Ever get that? What's going on when you get a girl? that does that. Hmm? Is with her the situation that I can't identify with my mother. So I'm going to go raise hell. Hmm? Here's, uh, my point is there's some interesting stuff there. Okay, now, let's go, however, to religion. I can erase this, can I? The, uh, the, uh, don't forget this stuff, though. You know what I like about it, ego and superego? I don't care whether it's true or not. It's so much fun. You know, it's just so much fun. But uh, now, one of the things Freud is going to say is we are always looking for this father. He did another book called Moses and Monotheism. We don't have time to do that. Uh, today. We can do it if you want to sometime. But Moses in monotheism, he says that the uh, that Moses, he contends, was not a Jew but an Egyptian. And that he identified with Achnaton. Eventually that was in a monotheism. And in that monotheism 
Uh, he basically establishes that. That eventually becomes the Jews. It becomes a religion of the Father. I remember Freud is a secular Jew, okay? Uh, and uh, in Mosin Monotheism, he argues now, along comes also Paul, <laughs> Saul, who becomes Paul. And what does Saul argue when he becomes a Christian? He argues for a religion of the Son. where the son must be sacrificed, suffer and die in order for salvation to be secured. The Oedipal complex gets addressed this way in Christianity. Am I being clear? In other words, if you've got this Oedipal complex, this threatening father that you want to kill, what do you do to address the kind of guilt that comes from that? Well, you have a religion of the son where the son instead suffers and dies all right, and settles the score. Hmm? Now, the problem is, what if it ain't true? <laughs> Which he says it isn't. He says what you've got there is that we want, we want this Oedipal complex resolved. And what religion does, religion is an illusion. And what is an illusion? It's not necessarily false. He says that quite explicitly. Not necessarily false, but it's mainly a wish fulfillment. Now, he thinks in terms of religion, it is finally false. That's his conviction. But wish fulfillment is an illusion. And he says it is an obsessional neurosis where the id and the ego are not successfully addressed, but rather you have this ongoing conflict that is, I'm going to use the language, papered over in this uh, sun religion, and the basic issues are not addressed. Okay? So that he says that this primal father growing out of these earlier monotheisms, he believes that those historical recollections operate in us today. All right. They've not left us. They are there. Okay? And that the primal father is still with us. And one of the ways we deal with that is with an obsessional neurosis. All right? To solve this conflict between the father and children. So what do you say about all the families that don't have fathers present anyway? Yeah. Uh, about children that don't, uh, families that don't have fathers, he would say that it's, uh, I would say it's, it, 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 he, I think he would say, I need, a, I need a place where I can point you. Let me look for that next one. Let me, let me tell you what I think. I think he would say that while it may be true a family does not have father, it would not obviate the centrality of fathers in virtually in great many families, yeah. And uh, but let me find, let me see if I can find a, a passage where he actually uh, lays that out. Uh, uh. But do you see what's going on here? Religion is an obsessional uh, uh, is a is a. I'm sorry. Religion is an illusion. All right. It is an obsessional neurosis. Remember, that's a conflict between ego and id that's unresolved and continues to drive us, okay, around a primal father. But that primal father also has expression 
in today's fathers. And he sees religion, he sees Christianity as the religion of the Son, which addresses this. However, he's going to say it is an obsessional neurosis. And we need to be clear of it by becoming more scientific and more reasonable. Uh, where is that? Well, here's, here's a passage. He says, Thus I must contradict you when you go on to argue that men are completely unable to do without the consolation of religious pollution. That without it they could not bear the troubles of life and the cruelties of reality. That is true certainly of the men into whom you have instilled the sweet or better sweet poison. He's talking about religion. <laughs> From childhood onwards. But what of the other men who have been sensibly brought up? Perhaps those who do not suffer from the neurosis will need no intoxicant to deaden it. They will, it is true, find themselves in a difficult situation. They will have to admit to themselves the full extent of their helplessness and their insignificance hmm? in the machinery of the universe. They can no longer be the center of creation, no longer the object of tender care on the part of a benefic beneficent providence. They will be in the same position as a child who has left the parental home where he was so warm and comfortable. But surely infantilism, that's what he calls that, <clears throat> is destined to be surmounted. He used the word men. Men cannot remain children forever. They must in the end go out into hostile life. We may call this education to reality. Need I confess to you that the sole purpose of my book is to point out the necessity of this forward step. Okay? Uh, are we, um, make sense? Come back at it. Comment, question? Where would you take him on? question about Freud himself. Does he ever, did he ever undergo psychoanalysis himself? Oh, he's, that's the first thing he did was psychoanalyze himself. But he did himself. He was the only one who knew enough about it to do it. Yeah, but he did do it. And, and quite frankly, a lot of people say that uh, that's a brilliant piece of work. Again, I would say what I, I quoted someone, I don't remember who it is, who said that Freud was a great observer. It's his interpretations you have to watch. Thank you. But uh, he did. And then he has, he has works where he uh, walks you through an analysis, he, an, 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 a, a psychoanalysis he did with other people. And he has a variety of those. So you could read that. Um, uh, now I think you got to say two or three things about the man. One, an enormous work ethic. An enormous work ethic. When he wrote Moses and Monotheism in, uh, I guess that had been 1838 or 30, not, not 1938 or 39, he had jaw cancer. It was in severe pain. And what he did was he would write for an hour every day on Monos Moses and Monotheism until he finished it. And it's only 120 or 30 pages, but uh, so tremendous discipline. Brilliant, no question about that. Um, and uh, and what? And I just love to read him. That does not constitute agreement. I, I've learned to read a lot of people I love without agreeing with them. I, I read Foucault, but somebody accused me last week of you know, you got to remember Foucault had problems. And I said, well, you think I don't know that? <laughs> oh, yeah, well, who doesn't? Oh, by the way, about Moses and Monotheism, very interesting thing. 
Freud does not get Paul at all. I, I, I don't have it. I wrote at the bottom, Freud does not understand the Apostle Paul. <laughs> he accuses him of things Paul doesn't say. I guess he just kind of read him in the light of what was around maybe at his, in, in his time. But um, So, how do we say it? One, last week we looked at Nietzsche. And Nietzsche basically was arguing... Strangely enough, because he's earlier than either of the two we'll look at now, that Freud or Sartre. He was basically arguing a postmodern view and basically continued that, contended that religion was a uh, falsification of reality. Of course, he believed that, that it was an enfeebling thing that it did not pay attention to the will, the drive to power. It, uh, it made us weak people, you know, and so forth. And he basically argued, this is a postmodern piece. He argued that for perspectivism, perspectivism, the basic argument of that is everything is a perspective. Problem was, he thought his wasn't. Uh, but uh, but that's the postmodern kind of notion now. You know, if you really, we don't deal with truths. We deal with perspectives and so forth. And then with Freud, we're seeing a psychological approach to really a psycho uh, analytic approach to and with uh, Sartre, next week, we'll be looking with an existential approach. So we're looking at three of them, okay? Postmodern, psychoanalytic, and existential approaches to atheism. Okay? And if you're okay with that, beyond that, uh, would, it, would you be willing me to do a critique of each of them the fourth Sunday? Would that, or do you need that? Do you kind of feel like you've already got it yourself? Okay. And then be thinking about what you want to do next. Okay. Remember, I actually do listen to you and try to do what I hear. Okay. Come in over here. I'm sorry. Is 